Hey guys, this video is sponsored by Ibble. Make sure you guys download the app, follow me, and talk to me on there. Hey guys, welcome back to the Blair White Project. Today I have a super exciting guest, Dr. Deborah So. And you and I actually go way back because you put me in Playboy years ago. <laughs> I love that interview. It was one of the first interviews I ever did with anyone. Really? Oh, wow. I didn't yeah. know it was one of your first. That's amazing. Well, it was like such a moment for me because it was like one of my first like big interviews. So it's so cool that years later, it's like everything comes full circle. Now you're on my show. It's so great. Absolutely. My my first interview ever with, was with someone who designs vibrators for a living. You were second interview <laughs> and then third interview was Ben Shapiro. So you have fun. had quite the career arc, Dr. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. So for those of you who don't know, Dr. Deborah is a former sex researcher. She has written a book called The End of Gender, which I highly recommend. And you've been on Joe Rogan. You've been out there and you have really been you've come to be known for being a bit of a contrarian. You take stances that are quite different than other people in your field, your scientific peers. So how about we start with just listing some of the things that you debunk in your book, The End of Gender, and some of the main stances that you take a different stance on than um, people in your industry? Right. So The End of Gender debunks nine myths. And so some of the myths include, and we have much overlap, I have to say, in terms of the things that we are concerned about, um, the idea that young children should transition. Another myth is that there are no differences between women and women who are born women and transgender women, that biological sex is a spectrum, that gender is non-binary, that uh, gender neutral parenting works, um, that men and women should approach sex and dating in the same way. I'm trying to think, oh, and also that social justice should be intertwined with the science and academic research. Definitely no. So um, in terms of my background, you know, as you said, I'm a, a former academic sex researcher. I used to use brain imaging techniques to understand human sexuality. And I had noticed this huge trend of um, media coverage of young kids with gender dysphoria transitioning very at a very young age. And all the coverage said that this is a good thing for these kids, but from a scientific research that is not the best way forward. It's better to wait until puberty to see how they feel because most of them are going to outgrow their feelings by that point. So I wrote a, an op-ed about this. Uh, I knew that publishing it would make, mean that I would not be able to continue on in academia because the climate had become so political. So that was my decision. I felt strongly enough that I, I had to say what I believed and what the research was saying. So from that point on, I've been a journalist. As you mentioned, I started writing as a columnist for Playboy.com shortly after. Now my book is coming out and I also have a podcast. So it's been it's been a wild ride. But yeah, I feel like right now, especially it's I, I can't believe the extent to which science denial has been pushed in terms of the realm of gender. It's It's unbelievable. It absolutely is. You know, I think that it's always so ironic for me. And I want to get into the nitty gritty of like all these issues and really get like the full perspective and what you feel and what you think based on the research, because I know that I can be quite aggressive. And I know that the way I talk about these things can sometimes be in a way that, you know, people are automatically put off on on the other side. Um, so I feel like it's good to have someone who's like even keel, knows what they're talking about. And I think this episode is going to be chock full of information. So I want to start with, first of all, how the field of gender and sex research got so politicized, because it seems to me that in a world that makes sense, this would be one of those issues that isn't so political because it just kind of is what it is. But apparently that's not the case. What got us here? I would say within the field of sex research, definitely there's been this history of tension between academic sex researchers and activists, and especially around the subject of gender, gender dysphoria, transitioning, sexual orientation. All these subjects are generally taboo in general, I'd say more broadly in our in our society, especially if you go back, you know, decades. But the there was one particular instance of one of one of the researchers in the field. He published a book about transitioning and autogynophilia. So we can talk about autogynophilia as well if you'd like. But so basically this really upset the activists. And in the book, it talks about how trans women, some some of them are motivated to transition due to an erotic interest in becoming a woman. This is so Ray this Blanchard, big... right? That's his name? Um, it's Ray Blanchard's work. So Ray is actually a mentor and a friend of mine, but this was Michael Bailey's book. So Mike's, oh. Mike's book basically put this idea out, out into the mainstream. 
And when, I mean, the way he, I talk about this in, in The End of Gender, about the ways in which the activists went after him, really tried to destroy his life, not just his professional career, but also his personal life. Um, to this day, I would say, you know, he probably still has to deal with some of the, the backlash in, in terms of the things that they said and, and did to him. Anyone in the field who has tried to go against activist orthodoxy faces this type of intimidation and pushback and you know detrimental effects to their career ray has as well i mean i don't want to speak for these individuals but you know you, you can see it on the sidelines very clearly and so there's this history of people don't want to upset the activists and i think because the activism has now become so mainstream so accepted um and so many people have something to gain by going along with it as well legitimate experts in the field stay quiet because they don't want to get involved they nowadays you just get fired i mean there's no way you could say the things that i say and still be in the university right. um, or as a researcher it, it just wouldn't happen so i think that's part of the reason why the discourse has become so sl slanted and and also because it is a very emotional subject i mean i try to always be very respectful and sensitive the way i talk about this but i think also if most people who are not following it that closely who may not know about the scientific research they're being told new studies are coming out showing that there are millions of genders or that the best way for these kids is to allow them to transition and that you're cruel and you're heartless and you're bigoted if you don't agree with that so i think all of these things together have created the climate that we're currently in. And, and it worries me because I'm not sure how we're going to get out of it at this point. Right. It seems to me that we're sort of in this period of like intense cultural fixation on gender and specifically transgenderism, which has not been the case. I mean, I'm not that old. I'm only 28. But even I remember a time even just less than a decade ago where no one really knew what the word transgender meant. Um, and there's an argument to be said that that's not great either, that people shouldn't be completely ignorant of these things. But what we're seing is sort of the opposite where it's on everyone's mind 24 seven, and you have this issue of what many people call the social contagion of trans, which I completely think it is a social, social contagion. Um, I'm not taking away the fact that I am transgender and happy with my choice, but I can just so clearly observe what's happening here and how these kids are being sort of like, just pushed into this well of gender ideology, which as your book points out, and as so much of your other work online that I've seen points out, is so full of potholes really, and plot holes more like actually, because um, it is like a fairy tale that's made up about gender. And I think that, tell me if you agree with this, I think that a lot of people feel as though it's comparable to the gay rights movement, to gay issues, and it's people just want to be on the right side of history. And so whatever new talking point comes out, whether it's 12 year olds can get double mastectomies, whether it's there's this many genders, people jump on board with it and not really knowing what's going on. I think there's a simultaneous extreme um, fixation on gender, but at the same time, an intense ignorance to these issues as well. Yeah, because I think activists, they've been very smart in the way they've marketed this movement and they really have piggybacked on the gay rights movement. And as someone who grew up in the gay community, so I'm straight, but all my friends growing up were gay men. I I remember how horribly they were treated and I still think homophobia is an issue in society today. And I think especially with the push with the kids, a lot of that is is in some ways being fueled by homophobia. But definitely, I think most people just, they see what how gay people were treated and they think, well, we don't wanna make that mistake again. So now they're overcompensating in the other direction. But as you said, there's a difference. And I think especially with many of the young people who are latching onto gender now, many of them have other issues, comorbidity, psychological comorbidity, you know, even something as simple as going through puberty, it's a difficult time. And for them now they're being told any discomfort in their body is a sign that they're not actually the sex that they're born as. And for many people, you know, they see how vitriolic this subject is and they think, well, I don't wanna be the target of that. So sure, I'll just, I'll just go along with this because that's what I'm being told. And and what they're seeing of the kids, especially transitioning, is that they're they seem happier after they're being presented like their lives are so much better. So I think it's been it's been very smart the way this is the whole thing has been um, rolled out. And you know, I think unless you really have you feel very strongly that you have to say something, most people understandably are not going to because they're not going to risk what they have to lose as a result. Right. Yeah. And I and I always try to remember that that I'm in a position where I actually have the, for lack of better wording here, the privilege to be able to speak out on these issues and actually make a living from it. And I have to remember sometimes when I get so intense about it that there are people who are just living their lives and this is not the hill they're gonna wanna die on, you know, but 
to me it's important and that's why I'm glad it's important to you as well. You said something interesting. You said that a lot of the children transitioning issue um, is sort of related to homophobia. Would you mind elaborating on that? Yeah, so I think, and this is not the case for all parents, obviously, who are allowing their kids to transition because I do have a lot of empathy for them. I think they are in a difficult position, especially if they're being told by professionals that you have the choice of having a dead son or a happy daughter or conversely, you know, a dead daughter and a happy son. Obviously, no child, no no parent is going to say, of course, I'm going to, of course, they're going to choose the happy child. They're, they're not going to want to put their their child in a position of making any any type of decision like that. So in terms of the homophobia, though, I think there are some parents who are bothered by the fact that they have a gender atypical child. So if they have a son who is feminine or a daughter who is masculine, they probably on some level know that that child may grow up to be gay and that makes them uncomfortable. And so transitioning, if you have a feminine boy or a masculine daughter, so if, if you have a, a feminine boy who is attracted to men when he gets older, if he transitions to female, she will then appear to be a straight woman. And I know I don't do clinical work anymore. I don't work with this population or these kids, but from the conversations I've had with my colleagues, they will say that some of these parents will out, outright say they don't want to have a gay child. Wow. And that to me is so upsetting. Wow. And it's it's crazy to me that I really see this, this, if you talk to, you know, like I said, I'm straight, but if you talk to gay men and lesbian women, they'll say, they see themselves in these children and they see what this is, the bigger, the bigger reason why this is happening. Yes, this is why, you know, I think back to my early development and I had a lot of those very stereotypical signs, right, of like a trans kid. Um, I liked Barbie and pink and, and, and I was always playing with the girls and everything about me was more feminine. I always existed more on that side of the spectrum, right? But I look at a lot of my gay male friends who are happy gay adult male friends and they have an almost identical narrative. They have the same exact experiences, the same interests. They grew up in the same way. And so I look at that and I'm like, okay, then it seems to me it's a roll of the dice if transition would even be something that these people would be comfortable with long term. So to make those decisions as a child just seems insane to me. And it's not even really a roll of the dice because trans is so much more rare than gay that even, even a roll of a dice would be more, you know, what I'm trying to say, uh, it'd be more fair. But so I think that the idea that we're sort of hopping on this bandwagon and not thinking about the long-term consequences um, is really scary. What's the type of backlash or what type of backlash have you gotten um, being one of the lone, I mean, there are a few others, but one of the very few people in your field to actually speak out and, and say what you're saying? Hmm. Well, let me just say before I get to that, that I do support transitioning in adults. Obviously, I always want to be very clear with that. And I think even for kids who persist into puberty, if they still experience gender dysphoria, I think the decision the decision should be up to that child with the clinician. And it should not be about wider societal influence or activists getting involved. I think it, in an ideal situation, it would just be left between the child and the clinician. But yeah. unfortunately, that's not the climate we're in right now. But in terms of what I've had to deal with, I generally try not to complain because I feel very fortunate to be in this position and to have had the opportunities I've had. I feel like it is a miracle that my book even got published. So I'm very grateful for that. But definitely, I mean, there are things that, and I'm sure you've dealt with your fair share of crazy. I remember you tell, actually, when I interviewed you the first time, uh, you were telling me about some of the things you've had to deal with. Uh, well, I mean, my book was pulled from a very prominent retailer, permanently pulled, um, so they won't sell it. Uh, what, what else has happened to me? Uh, you know, professional opportunities. I've lost some, but then, you know, others come along. So I just try to be um, positive about it. Even with my podcast, I have some people telling me that they subscribe to it on certain platforms and then they're magically unsubscribed, <laughs> which is creepy because I think to myself, I don't know what it is I'm doing that is upsetting people so much. Like, I get that what I'm saying is not in lockstep with what's acceptable, but if it's backed by research, and I mean, it's if you disagree with me, I'm perfectly happy to talk with people, not you in particular, but I'm happy to talk to people who disagree with me. And and that's the way that you're supposed to go about science. You know, I come from a scientific training. So to me, the solution is not to shut people down because whatever the reality or truth is, it's always going to come to the surface and it's always going to be there. It's just a matter of you're, what you're doing then is prolonging the inevitable, which to me is is not a good way to go about anything in life. And it seems to me, based on everything, you know, I follow you on social media, so I see your posts all the time. And it seems to me that, you know, people who attack you, it's so misguided because even if 
they believe, which apparently they do, that your rhetoric is harmful or, you know, harming trans kids or harming trans people. I think it comes across very clear that you don't have those intentions, that you're seek you're simply, you know, coming at this issue from a perspective that they're not used to. I don't see any bad intentions. And the fact that you support, you know, trans adults making decisions for their bodies, it's like, that's all you can really ask for. You know, people ask me all the time, how can you sort of, you know, talk with all these conservatives, not including you, I don't really know what you identify as politically, you said quite liberal, but you know, I do a lot of work with like, Daily Wire and, and conservatives and um, and I'm like, you know, I've never had anyone tell me to my face I shouldn't have had the right to transition or that adults shouldn't be able to transition. And maybe they believe that, but to me, the, the kid thing is so much more important of an issue. I think it's so irrelevant what anyone does with their body and as an adult. So it's great that you take that stance. Yes. Well, thank you. That, that means a lot. Yeah. I would still call myself a liberal. I'm definitely not far left. I'm definitely not in favor of all the crazy social justice, wokeness. Um, but I, I, you know, I used to take it personally when I would hear that people thought that I was hateful or bigoted. Actually, it's it's funny because I have been added to a couple of hate lists and people will tell me like, right. oh, my friend or so-and-so told me not to read your work or not to pay attention to you because you're like anti this or anti that. And I realized, you know, I can't control that. So the way I see it is if someone's not going to take the time to actually look up what I say or to read my work or actually read my book, then that's probably not someone who I really want in my audience anyway, because if they're just going to simply go based on what someone else randomly says. And I think in some cases, especially when it's in the news, uh, you know, and I say this as a journalist, which makes me sad. I think sometimes people intentionally misrepresent what we say because yes. they want us to be the bad guy and they want it to fit a narrative of how we are pushing certain things that we're not saying. So, I mean, I had one instance when I was out of speaking engagement and um, this journalist came in and was sitting in, in the event and he was live tweeting it. And I remember looking at the tweets after and I thought, there's no way that he sat through this entire event and actually came away thinking that I said any of the things he claimed I said, unless he fell asleep and just woke up at the, like, right. the last 10 minutes, and forgot where he was, and maybe had a, some feverish dream. But that told me a lot. You know, I said, there's, I feel, I like I said, I try to be really responsible and respectful. And if people willingly want to overlook that, there's not really a lot I can do. So I just, you know, don't pay attention to it. Right. How in tune are you with kind of how gender is treated um, globally? I mean, obviously you are, but like I think of the Middle East and I think of the ways in which trans is treated there. I think that in America, we sort of have this totem pole mentality and we think like gay rights came, you know, here and then trans rights after and trans is almost treated or in people's eyes as like more taboo or less socially acceptable than than gay. Maybe it's changing now, but you look at places in countries in the Middle East where there are, you know, gay people that are actually pushed to transition to cure them of homosexuality. So to anyone who's maybe like shocked that you or I would have this perspective that these children transitioning in America sometimes are indicative of homophobic parents or homophobic environments, um, you actually see this playing out in the Middle East, right? Yeah, there are many cultures in which I would say, especially if gender atypicality is frowned upon, you will see, and I think many people will internalize that as a message growing up, and that may also be part of the reason why they decide to transition. So for me, you know, I I think people should be able to live their lives how they choose. I'm not here to judge anybody in their decisions. I just want to provide information so that people can make the best decisions for themselves. And I think also with what you're saying with regard to what else is happening in the world, you know, if you look at Europe and what's happening in the UK, countries like Sweden and Finland, where they are rolling back the way yes. they are approaching treatment of kids with gender dysphoria, uh, in terms of gender affirmation and saying, you know, maybe we need to focus more on psychological interventions and therapy. And it's just beyond me. I don't know why in North America we are still not, we're not really following down that path or even really questioning it. It's it's going, still going full steam ahead. Yeah, I think that we have this just raging culture war and neither side really wants to let this go as an issue that we can fight about. And, you know, um, I think about that a lot. I think about, you know, how many people are truly invested in the truth, right? Versus a narrative, versus their side winning. Because I think about, you know, Recently, there were some pictures going viral. I'm sure you saw because I think we're tuned into similar algorithms on Twitter. We follow similar people. Um, you know, there's all these pictures of these young girls coming out that are undergoing double mastectomies and surgeries. And th this is so dark, but you see the like, cuts all over their bodies and you see that they had been self-harming. And you think, how in the world are their surgeons 
comfortable or morally okay with operating on these teenagers who are clearly going through what so many teenagers before them have gone through when it comes to being uncomfortable or even hateful of their bodies. And yet we're just going, like you said, full steam ahead with these surgeries. I, I don't understand why we are hanging on to it with this just like tenacity. You know, you have President Biden who, you know, despite all these clinics in Europe closing, despite, you know, new information about vision loss and brain swelling and puberty blockers as a result, he's not letting go at all. Um, so I guess I kind of understand what you said when you're like, I'm not so hopeful of how we're going to get out of it. Um, but is there sort of an end goal that you think needs to be achieved with like getting people to kind of figure out that this is bad? Does it just have to get way worse before it gets better? Or what's the like move here? Huh. You know, what? when you were mentioning the, the pictures of, of these girls with double mastectomies, I'm not sure if you saw the one. There's one of this young woman and her entire body is covered in self-harming scars. And she also that. has had a double mastectomy. It's so sad. I mean, I think in terms of people to, for this to, to finally reach its breaking point, for things to turn around, you know, with the clinicians in particular, I, I know many people really don't have nice things to say about them. I think some of them genuinely believe that what they're doing is the right thing. It's probably a minority. I think just the fact that we are seeing more and more of this pushback, especially with the transitioners speaking up, more of them coming forward and people hearing their stories and seeing that, you know, this is this is not something that is a fringe minority or the way that they are being framed by activists as being either not it's a phenomenon that's not happening or that, you know, they in some way are incentivized to make the trans community look a certain way when that's clearly not the case. These are just young people, particularly yeah. young women speaking about their experiences and trying to warn other people not to go down this path. But I think it's just going to take more time. And yeah, it's probably going to have to get a lot worse. But I really didn't think it was ever going to be this bad. Like, this Me is either. pretty crazy. Yeah, I, I never. I mean, when I first started transitioning, it was 2014, 2015. And everything was so different back then. You couldn't find a detransitioner to talk on camera. It wasn't really a thing. I mean, I'm sure it existed, obviously, but it was not at the levels it is now. Um, one of the things that really brings me pause on this issue is I think back to when I first sought medical intervention for gender dysphoria and wanted to transition. I went to a quite esteemed, um, what's the word for a hormone doctor? Endocrinologist. I went to quite an esteemed endocrinologist in my area um, where I was living at the time. And he had been working in the area for so long. He had a great reputation. And I remember the studio science that he was spewing at me. I walked in and first of all, I walked out with a hormone prescription about 20 minutes later. But in those 20 minutes, I was never informed of any risks. I was never informed of any um, thing I would have to do to maybe get my health to a certain place before undergoing such a radical, you know, <laughs> procedure. Um, it, there was never any discussion of the actual transition plan. I think it's quite disturbing that the patient gets to decide what the right move is here. Um, there was never any requirement for documentation from a therapist. Um, and I think that back then things were more conservative with how we treated <laughs> gender transition. And now it's even looser. Um, do you find that in the people that you talk to that that's something that's way more common now? That sort of lack of guidelines? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, like in Canada, say, we have a law that's got, that's come into place now where clinicians cannot really practice any form of therapy besides affirmation or they face potentially going to prison for five years. So I think the rest of the world really? looks at us and says, like, what on earth are you guys doing? I mean, if, even if you take the science out of it, just children Ch can children consent to life altering decisions about their bodies and about their reproduction i think most people would say mm, i don't think we should listen to what a young kid has to say in terms of how they feel maybe maybe ask them some questions and try to understand but even that is can be considered transphobic so uh, you know you in the us you guys do have some of the states i think it's like 27 states now have convert so called conversion therapy bans that conflate gender identity and sexual orientation. So I obviously don't support conversion therapy for sexual orientation because you can't make someone who's gay or bisexual straight. Right. But gender identity is different because especially with kids, their gender identity can change. They The way they feel about their bodies can change. And so, it, yeah, I, on some level, though, I try to put myself in the perspective of what these activists are pushing for. And 
I, you know, I'm not transgender, but I am sympathetic to this argument about gatekeeping. And I, I don't think it's fair for adults to have to feel like they have to, I don't know. When I spoke to Rose of Dawn, I remember on her podcast, she was saying that it felt like having to have a cheat code to transition. So I feel like it's not really fair to make someone have to go above and beyond, I think, to get the care that they deserve. Do you know what I mean? So I uh, yeah. understand that to some extent. I'm sympathetic to that. But at the same time, I think there needs to be some form of guardrails in place. Otherwise, sometimes people make decisions that aren't good for them, even if they really, really want it. Especially, um, I would love to hear your thoughts on this. And people are going to, you know, probably try to eat me alive for saying this, but it's true, so I don't care. There seems to be, from the outside looking in, a really huge intersection between other mental illnesses and people who suffer with gender dysphoria or maybe don't even suffer with dysphoria but misperceive other illnesses and problems in life situations as trans. Um, I, I, I find that it's hard to find a trans person both in real life and both online that doesn't also suffer from some sort of other mental illness. So what is that intersection and, and what accounts for that? What causes that if you even agree it exists? Yeah, no, I definitely think there is a lot of overlap, especially nowadays because it has become so trendy. So anyone with any type of mental issue or unhappiness and, and latches on to this movement because it gives them meaning, I think. It, they may legitimately think that this is the reason why they feel the way they feel. But I do think a lot of it is, I mean, especially for people who are really nasty about it, I do think they probably have a personality disorder, especially something like borderline personality disorder. One of the key characteristics of that personality disorder is a shifting or unstable sense of self or identity. So people will often, they don't have a, a good sense of who they are. It tends to change very rapidly over time. And so I, you know, I have no judgment for people with personality disorders. I hope that they can get the the help that they need. But I, I that also speaks to, I think, why they are so, uh, some of these activists are so awful and so, so aggressive because they don't have a strong sense of who they are. And very much their self-perception, I think, is dependent on what other people see in them or, yeah. or think of them. And they need that validation. So if they feel threatened in that way, they really need to double down and try to make you feel horrible or potentially ruin your life over it because they are not happy with themselves. But I mean, in terms of other comorbidity, you know, it's really, really common for anxiety, depression, eating disorders. Um, but yeah, it's, you need to be able to talk to a therapist to figure out exactly what, what is the thing that's going to make you feel better. And I, I don't think changing outward or external appearance is going to solve something that is happening internally with someone. Right. And that seems to go directly into the issue with, you know, you talked about the law in Canada that can send people potentially to prison for five years for conversion therapy, which is really just, you know, at best, like a gentle pushback on the idea that someone's trans because maybe they aren't. It seems to me that when there are these other comorbidities and there are all these are these like intersecting issues that a lot of people are not getting their issues taken care of because of these laws. Right. right. And so what happens then if and when they do transition, they're still going to have the same issues underlying, you know, whatever it was they were dealing with previous to the transition. And I think that is part of the reason why detransitioning is is becoming such a huge phenomenon, because for many of these young people, they had other um, mental health issues that weren't being addressed. And so even if you transition successfully, you're still going to be dealing with whatever it was you were dealing with before. And if that wasn't addressed and if that was the real reason why you were feeling the way you did and you mistakenly thought it was due to gender or your sex, then it's it's unfortunately not going to help you. 100%. And, you know, I somewhat remember falling into one of the sort of like um, common narratives of detransitioners is they fall into these online spaces that sort of um, make it seem as if transitioning will fix all their problems. So a lot of these people come from unhappy homes, bad environments, um, even like war-torn countries a lot of the times people fall into this. Um, and I remember, you know, I was never heavy into those groups, but I was a little bit online when I first started. And I also remember like having this sort of blind expectation that my life would become amazing once I transitioned, um, which wasn't the case. You know, I still had certain things from my childhood that I had to address that I'm still working on now. And there's just so much. And, and the idea that this is sold to kids as some sort of fix-all pill 
is really terrifying, especially when there's so much de these development years that they're transitioning during is like, I can't even imagine what kind of population we're going to have years from now when a certain segment of it literally never went properly through puberty. This is new, right? This has not happened really before. Right. And I mean, there is research. I can talk about the research in terms of what it's shown with the long term effects of, of that intervention. But I would also say I, with these with the ideology more broadly and things like sex as a so social construct or sex as a spectrum, I think those ideas are also what are leading some people to make the decision to think that transition is an easy fix, because in their mind, if, if sex is a social construct, well, then if you are born female and you want to be male, you can just want to be male and that you know, magically can just happen, even though that realistically is not possible. And I also think a lot, because a lot of this is happening online, especially for young people, they don't fully realize what it means to change, try to change your sex, right? And I don't, I hopefully that's, that's not disrespectful for me to say that, but no, it's true. I, I think some of them, they don't really, they don't really think about it because online you can change your identity and change the way you look. It's you a know, great point. The magic of, of apps and Photoshop, you can, it's, it's not difficult. So I think for some of them, especially young kids are not looking that far down the line. I, I don't think they really can fully conceptualize what it means to transition. Right. And just the idea, first of all, falsely that you can change your biological sex is insane. But w what is the argument? Like maybe I'm going crazy. What is the argument that if, if gender and sex are social constructs, because people say even sex is, which is even crazier, but mm -hmm. you know, if that's the case, then what is the argument for these kids undergoing these surgeries and changing their bodies, which are objectively not social constructs? I mean, having breasts, not a social construct, having, you know, a lack of breasts, that, that's still your body. H how do they have those two thoughts in their head at once? I've asked myself that a lot. And especially in writing the book, I was trying to reconcile many of these uh, contradictory ideas and you can't. I, I don't know. I think some people are just existing in a different universe in which they choose not to think about it. It doesn't necessarily affect them, so they don't need to. And ultimately, I think what it comes back to is just trying to undermine mind society and, you know, dismantle norms, disrupt norms and rewrite facts and reality. There's no objective truth. So whatever, I mean, if if it were the case that gender were non-binary or that sex were a spectrum, I think the activists would just be wanting to say then, okay, sex is binary, gender is binary. They would just want to push back and go against what the norm in society is. Uh, going back to your earlier question about puberty blockers, there is research to show that, you know, as you mentioned, there's um, there was a, a warning that was added to by the FDA to the label saying that pseudotumor cerebri, so this is swelling or in, increased brain pressure can be a side effect. Um, we also see lower bone mass density. Um, and it's still, you know, we don't really have long-term data in this population of kids with gender dysphoria. So we need to have more time. And again, I think if the research is showing that most kids are going to change their mind at puberty, what, it, doesn't, it doesn't really make sense. I think it makes more sense to, to see what happens and, and to be a little bit more conservative in terms of how we're approaching this subject. Part of the problem that I've observed, and I know that you've obviously, you know, watched this space for even longer than I have, is there's an intense amount of gaslighting that goes on that has sort of gotten us to this point. And what I mean by that is, if you go back to like, I don't know, 2014, and if you even mentioned children transitioning, the argument from everyone around you is gonna be like, that's not something that happens. That's something that happened like four times in Sweden in the 90s and, you know, whatever. And then slowly you're seeing, OK, but there are literally 17 year olds on the Internet making YouTube videos about their transition progress and on these drugs. And they say, OK, but that's only in this state. And then, then it gets to the point where, you know, I went to my plastic surgery clinic recently in uh, Dallas, Texas, where I had gotten work done. I was taking my friend to go to her appointment and be sort of like a nurse for her. And um, the front desk woman was telling me that they just um, passed the law to ban minors from undergoing these surgeries in Texas and that prior to that they were operating on 12 year olds for double vasectomies. But then the problem further is people are so slow to catch up to that that 
I'm tweeting about this and hey, like there are 12 year olds at my clinic that were just getting double mastectomies. And the overwhelming response is, this is a lie, this isn't happening, 12 year olds don't get it to happen. So is that a huge part of the problem here that people are just slow to catch up with the information? And because of that, there are people that push things through sort of silently under the radar? Probably. And I think for those people who are attacking you on social media, they're incentivized to do that. They're trying to intimidate you. They're trying to shame you so that other people think that you don't know what you're talking about when you clearly do. So, yeah, and I think it's just an easy easier for people to turn a blind eye to it and not see what's happening because it is shocking. It is shocking. And it's pretty horrific. And anyone who doesn't think that, I'm not sure... I'm not sure where the disconnect is. I, I don't, again, I don't think young girls could be making a decision like that. And so, yeah, it, it, I don't know what it's going to take. I think many people are just in a state of denial because it is so shocking, right. but the evidence is resurfacing. I mean, you can't deny it. It's like, especially last week, I feel like it was like every day there was another, another piece, another horrific thing coming out that, you know, it's, it's like, how can you deny that this is actually happening? You can't. So it's it's easier just to pretend. It seems to me that this era will be looked back upon with like just absolute horror with what we've done to kids. And it's going to be looked at as a crime against humanity, really, in my opinion. Um, but I wanted to ask you, because one of the things that I'm very interested in is brain differences between the sexes. And this is something that's obviously controversial and people, you know, on a certain side of the aisle pretend that there aren't differences and men and women are equal. Um, I wanted to ask, what are the main brain differences that we can observe from males and females? And how does that relate to transgender brains? Because I know that there have been studies on transgender brains, and I know that those studies have sort of become taboo, because now there's this argument that doesn't have anything to do with the brain, which to me, the people arguing that are invalidating trans people. But then again, um, how do you feel about that? And what are the, so there's a lot of questions in one. But Yeah, my sense is there is this push to separate being trans or uh, will transition from gender dysphoria or anything that has to do with biology, which I understand because I guess if if we acknowledge that there are any biological correlates to gender dysphoria, then does that say that someone should be forced to or either not be allowed to transition and that it's purely in the brain and that something should be treated in the brain? Or does that also speak to say larger stigma or discrimination against trans people saying that uh, they that they don't what they're talking about because it's all in their minds which i obviously don't agree with but in terms of the research uh, because all of the research to date that has used a brain imaging in people who have gender dysphoria or who have transitioned has been conflated with sexual orientation or confounded with sexual orientation so they're the people in the study are also gay so oh, when wow. they scan their brains and they see these these brain differences it's not clear whether the brain differences are due to the person being gay or the person being trans so say if you're looking at a study of um, trans women if you all the people in the study of the trans women born male identifying as female also were sexually attracted to men so okay. in terms of sex research, because they're born male and attracted to men, they're considered gay. So when you're scanning their brains, it's not clear when, because there's a very clear, um, reliable network of brain regions that are associated with sexual orientation. So now when you see these brain differences, it's not clear whether what you're looking at is the gender dysphoria or the fact that they are attracted to people who share their sex. And so the problem is media coverage, especially when they, there was a study that was done in, I think it was adolescence, and they claim that this is a sign that being trans is in the brain, which it goes against, I guess. I mean, the activism is basically saying two different things that are contradicting them, themselves because they're saying that it's not in the brain, but then they're also promoting brain imaging studies that show that it is. But I think the reason why that study got so much attention is people were saying that this is something that is in the brain from a young age and it can be changed similar to how people view being gay except being gay is different because that is actually the, the truth about being gay but with you know gender dysphoria like we've been saying it can happen for people can experience it for a number of different reasons so um yeah i think ideally what would happen is we would be able to do more 
brain imaging studies on gender dysphoria, but, and that's going to be next impossible. There was a study that was, I'm trying to remember, I think it was in California that it got shut down a couple of years ago because they were doing brain imaging and then activists heard about this. So these poor researchers weren't even able to, to complete their study because the activists basically complained and they had it pulled saying, why are you doing brain imaging studies of people who are trans? That is so insane. And you know what? The idea that that sort of like shutting down of studies is supposed to benefit people like me is so backwards. Like I've had these discussions with my friends who are trans and, you know, wouldn't it be nice to know why we're like this? <laughs> like, I would like to know why I ended up this way. I would like to know what went wrong, what was different about me, like, because I don't actually have a concrete um, understanding of why this, why this occurred, whether it was something in the womb, um, whether it was something developmentally, like, so the idea that these activists are supposed to be fighting on my behalf, but are shutting down studies that could potentially lead to people understanding what I am more is absolutely insane. And this is why I combat them because this is exactly, th this is the definition of shooting yourself in the foot. They don't even, I don't think they even know what they're doing. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I would like to think that some of these people are well-intentioned, but I, I think it can be more nefarious than that. But with regard to say why people experience gender dysphoria, I do think it's a combination of biological factors as well as social ones. But, um, you know, I mentioned autogynophilia earlier and I hear from so many people who are autogynophilic who've told me that what I say and what I write about and in and, and my book has helped them because there's absolutely no object, well, not that there's no objective information, but it's buried. Like you have scientific papers that can be difficult for people to access but when you look up autogynophilia it's basically been branded as a myth or that it's it's debunked medical research and that's not true and so something like that you know i think it is a combination of the brain there it's somehow predispos predisposed predisposed to being paraphilic because i used to study paraphilias which are unusual sexual interests so it's it has that tendency and then on top of it there's probably things in the in the environment growing up that led them to find this idea of becoming a woman sexually arousing. Okay, I, I would love for you to kind of break down autogonophilia because I have a vague idea of what it is. And like you said earlier, it's the idea of being aroused by changing your gender. Um, and I see people sometimes make these memes or these charts, which are kind of funny in a way, but um, they'll have like half of the screen um, be like, you know, real trans women, right? And like, or they're called, um, what's the phrase for when you're a gay male trans woman? Probably HSTS, yes. which is like, and it, homosexual is not really a, an acceptable term anymore, but homosexual, transsexual. Right, so people make these graphs where like people like me are often pictured on the left with the HSTS. Um, people like um, Gigi Gorgeous YouTuber, or actually no, because she dates women now, so she wasn't on there. Um, why is it so much more common for these um, people to end up on the attracted to women spectrum as opposed you're not really seeing it in other transsexuals? Right. It's because, well, like, so as you, I guess I can, I'll ex explain just for people who may have never heard this before. So basically, yeah, if, if someone is born male, identifies as female, attracted to men, it's considered, now I, I'll say homosexual. I generally try not to be PC, but um, gay homosexual subtype uh, versus the heterosexual subtype is um, attracted to women. And for them, it's a paraphilia. It's an unusual sexual interest. And they're basically eroticizing. They're attracted to women, but it, there's something about the way that that developed that they're internalizing that attraction mm -hmm. and wanting to actually become the thing that they're attracted to. So there are other ways in which this can be experienced. So um, things like menstruation and lactation fetishes are common. So in terms of female bodily functions, that becomes erotic. Um, is that why you, think, okay, that, that, I, I don't want to interrupt you, but so that's why you see so many, cause this has blown my mind personally. I can understand like sort of the crazier aspects of trans ideology. I can kind of put myself behind the eyeline and be like, okay, it's crazy, but I get why they think that. I've never understood the menstruation thing and why you have trans women talking about cramps and period blood. So are you saying that these people are fetishists basically? Well, to some extent, I mean, I, I try to really stay away from, cause I, I, I think 
people thought again ophelia some of them are struggling i think especially in the culture war and i'm not i'm not saying that you're doing this but it can get really ugly and some people can be really nasty to people who experience autogynephilia right. or trans women who say are autogynephilic and i don't think that's fair um but i would say yeah i, I mean no woman enjoys getting her period no woman finds i don't think finds it sexually arousing to lactate or or be having her period but that's part of it i think it's because these individuals that to them is part of womanhood or an aspect of womanhood it's something that i would say is probably <laughs> going to offend some people but i'll say it research has shown that say some people thought a gynophilia will find it sexually arousing the idea of say doing the dishes or doing the laundry because that's what they associate with womanhood <laughs> So, wow. yeah, and Wait, I, why would I that guess upset people. Well, because it's like a stereotypically, I don't think women should have to do the dishes or do right. their laundry. I don't think that's necessarily tied to being a woman. Of but, course. Um, you know, and also just in terms of, say, cross dressing or wearing lots of makeup, you know, like I love makeup. I work as a makeup artist, as you know, I love makeup. But I th some women find it offensive that someone would think that that's what it means to be a woman. Right. So like if being offended by like drag and I get that. Yeah. Yeah. That's so you really put the pieces together on that for me because I was like, okay, now I understand why you see these people posting about tampons and, and pads when they literally, to me, that was like one of the few benefits I have as a trans person. Like there's a lot that kind of sucks about it. And I'm like, but thank God I don't have to have a period. So that's like insane to me. My God. But I think that the ways in which like this is so censored, it stops people from, people from being able to understand themselves. Like I can only imagine there probably is an intense amount of shame based around being autogynephilic because you're not allowed to really talk about it. And then you also see a lot of these people so that are in women's prisons that end up getting women pregnant. You see the Jessica Yaniv types, people who are out there like, enacting harm on the world. Is that something that's disproportionately on the autogynephilic spectrum as opposed to like an HSTS? Um, it'd be hard for me to say without actually going in and like looking at the numbers and actually doing a you know proper study based on data. But I would say in terms of trends or averages, you probably would be more inclined to see that um, because I don't, I don't think I need to say any more than that, but yeah, yeah I, I would say, um, the other thing is with hiding the information is that many more people who are autogynephilic, I think, are transitioning when it may or may not be the right choice for them. And I do think for someone with autogynephilia, if they say go see a clinician, and they decide that that is the right choice for them. I support that. I don't think we should judge someone's decision to transition right. if they do experience this. But I think hiding the information really does a disservice because many more of them, especially adolescent males, start having these feelings at puberty, they have nowhere to turn, they go look on the internet and this is what they're being told. So they assume, oh, I must be trans. And for some people who experience this, it can be something that they just live with and maybe they partake in part-time, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they need to leave, live full-time as a woman. Right. Um, so I have a few like rapid fire questions for you where I, it doesn't have to be rapid. The response can be as long as, as you want, but I want to sort of get some things just clear here. So is sex a spectrum and why do people say that it is no it's not a spectrum my sense is people say this because they want to be inclusive in, of intersex people which i think is a good thing um because but people with in, who are intersex they possess both male and female characteristics as i'm sure you know but sex is defined by gametes which are mature reproductive cells so you have eggs and sperm there's nothing in between eggs and sperm so conceptually sex is not a spectrum i think we can um advocate for equal rights for trans people and intersex people but we don't have to go in and lie about what the science shows in order to do that i think that that, that actually does a disservice to these individuals right and one of the things that I, I saw a tweet the other day that i thought was so spot on or no it wasn't a tweet one of my supporters messaged me this and i completely agreed um so it's interesting how the same people who advocate for children transitioning now on the basis that they can consent to these surgeries and these permanent treatments at one point, and you would know this better than me, were the same people saying that these surgeons that were operating on intersex babies, that it was somehow, you know, 
and I actually do agree with this, that it was a reprehensible evil that they were doing that because they couldn't consent. So it's interesting how stuff has flipped that now all of a sudden kids can consent. And I understand a 12 year old is different than a baby, but to me, I think that 12 year old still cannot consent. Um, it's just crazy how it's flipped, right? It used to be people saying that kids couldn't consent to these things and now it's the opposite. Yeah, that's another one of those contradictory beliefs. Or also that if you have a child, say, who is gender typical, they should be encouraged to be atypical. So little girls are, and I think that's a good thing, but you have some parents who are really militant about it who say, you know, if if a little boy is interested in, say, sports, that no, he should go into ballet or something. Right. But if that same little boy were naturally inclined toward more feminine interests, then that's something, that's a sign that he is actually a girl. I mean, it's it's so backwards in some ways. It's like, I, I don't think I don't think people actually think through it just sounds nice when you say it right it yeah. sounds nice and progressive and it sounds like you're ahead of the curve in terms of your thinking so I think that's really what's motivating it how common is intersex and how real are the stories that these doctors really give these babies that are born um, intersex basically sex changes is that really a thing or is that kind of a, a lore from a research perspective, as many as 1% of the population is intersex. But um, in terms of the surgeries, it's hard for me to say because I, you know, I don't have any experience with that. My sense is it comes to, it's really about a decision with the parents. Depending on the doctor that you speak with, they'll have a different perspective. Some of them say, you know, in terms of a child's well-being and functioning, they do stand behind the idea that surgery should be done. I probably, I'm a little bit more Hesitant, I would say, I, you know, I'm very much in favor of bodily autonomy, and I think that a child should be left alone and to be allowed to make that decision for themselves when they are of uh, an appropriate age. Or maybe they'll decide that they're perfectly comfortable in their body and they don't want to undergo any surgery, and I think that's totally fine too. But there's one um, medical condition that people often talk about. It's called ovotestis. So this idea that someone can produce both eggs and sperm but that's very rare that's one in twenty thousand cases and even oh, wow. in that case someone is not producing both eggs and sperm at the same time i looked very very deeply and carefully into the research on this because i wanted to know is is there any truth to what these people are saying and so no i mean a lot of it i think a lot of it is people just simply say something and that makes the other person say oh i guess this person knows what they're talking about so then they they yeah. don't push push back but if you actually go digging and you see are the things that these people are saying true they're not it seems to me like the study of of gender and sex is in many ways like a big messed up game of telephone it's kind of like things are said and there also is this aspect i think of people wanting certain things to be true like i don't know if it's a fascination with like life not being enough if that makes sense it's like you know, they have to believe things that aren't true about intersex people. They're people that think that hermaphrodites are real. Hermaphrodites are a myth, right? You can't be born with a penis and a vagina, or can you? Um, no, I think hermaphrodism was previously how people would refer to intersex, which then became disorders of sex development, and now is back to intersex. Okay, so in terms of language, <laughs> but so, so you can be born with a penis and vagina at the same time, or you can't? No, no. But okay. when I'm just saying with hermaphrodite, that term, what it was right. referring to, yeah. Right. It seems to me that there's this large aspect. Sorry about. I was just going to say with nullification surgeries, you can now. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't joke about that. Wait, what? You you can? Well, you're not born that way, but you can have it made. I didn't know that. I, can't I shouldn't. Believe. Honestly, I shouldn't, I shouldn't be laughing. I feel terrible about this, but well, yeah, I'm. So I'm, can... I'm I, I laugh when I'm nervous, so I, I assume you are too. That is insane. Wait, so you can get a surgery to have both a penis and a vagina. Yeah. So whatever you have, you just have the other one added to it. Which in, in this case, if there were a literature showing that these people feel better after, I would say, okay, you know, maybe I'm a little bit less uncomfortable with that. But I, I really question why these decisions, why people choose to do this. What is it that's motivating them? Wow. My... I, I just didn't know that. To me, that's, that reads as like just some form of like extreme body modification or something. I mean, you have people that like have like devil implants in their head, like horns and like, you know, just you know, crazy stuff, yeah. which, you know, I respect people do whatever they want. I'm big on bodily autonomy. But the idea that a surgeon is giving, because I thought you had to make a penis into a vagina. I didn't know you could just add a vagina. 
usually if you are doing a vaginoplasty, that's what is typically done. But now what they can do is they will um, basically create a neovagina, but also keep someone's penis if they want to, so that they have both. I, and then uh, it's considered like a girl clit, I guess. Like they consider it to be a large clitoris, even though it's technically a penis, which is not quite the same. <laughs> I, 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 I really am not trying to be demeaning about this. I'm not trying to, like that is very, very insane to me. I'm not saying that you agree I'm out of my mouth. That is insane to me. Wow, I did, I did not know that, okay. Um, I just where we're headed you know. yeah because my next question was going to be is there any reconciliation to be had here because i think about you know it's very interesting for me to talk about these things because you know i'm talking about trans issues i'm talking about the ways in which trans people are sort of having a hard time integrating into main society think of really all areas of life think of you know sports you know medical um people are now people are worried about bathrooms and like just everyday life stuff people are having this hard time sort of getting these two groups to integrate. Is there any reconciliation that you see could happen? Because I can think of some ways to get there, but I just don't think people are willing to do it. Like, how can we get to I, a point where they're part of society and everything's like normal? <laughs> I, th I think it's important for people to be um, open to change, right? And to be compassionate. But the way that the activism is going, and. I, I always, I mean, I don't need to say this to your audience, but, you know, I'm aware that the activists don't represent everyday trans people. And I think it's important for people more widely in society to re to re recognize that because if all you're seeing is a particular perspective or narrative, people assume that that is actually what the community thinks and it's by and large not. So I do think it's important to have different perspectives represented but the just the fact that this has become so ugly i think really puts off most people from even wanting to consider that and in some ways people are being radicalized in the opposite direction i do think the activism is pretty extreme but people are going in the opposite direction which also concerns me because i don't think it's fair the way that may end up affecting everyday trans people who never asked for these decisions in terms of prisons or in terms of sports. So I try to bring attention to that as much as I am critical of radical gender theory, you know, to also for people to be compassionate, empathic and recognize that most trans people just want to live their lives. They want to be left alone and they are not the ones asking for these ridiculous things. Yeah. I mean, and you do a really great job. That's one of the things that I really appreciate about your work is that you do a great job of presenting that fact that there are alternative viewpoints and that it's not just some monolith because oftentimes the way people, and I don't have to tell you this, the way people talk about this, these things in our sort of space that we sort of inhabit online can be pretty brutal. And, you know, I actually have a hard time being mad at them for it because I see some of the stuff that's happening, like these young girls that are covered in, in, in cutting scars and getting double mastectomies and the drag queen story hour, which I think is also an offshoot of gender identity. Um, you know, all this stuff. And it's like, how are people not being radicalized? How is there not going to be some pendulum effect from this? And how are we not going to get to a point where suddenly we're looking at trans adults? You know, I even see some detransitioners that question if even adults should be able to transition. And that kind of worries me. You know, I'm not trying to police the way they're, they're figuring out that territory. But at the same time, I'm like, I do hope that we just stick with the kid thing because yeah, that there is something to be said about a lot of adults are getting shoehorned into this as well. Um, but at least they're adults, you know, and to an extent you are responsible for your own actions. Um, so I think that as long as we can stick with the kids stuff, I think that that's like the way to fight it, if that makes sense. That's my hope. And it's crazy to me when you talk about, you know, you mentioned drag queen story hour, the fact that people are concerned about, now I don't, I love drag queens. I have to say, I don't think most queens are trying to groom children. But I think it's worth questioning why is it that there are some people who really want to expose kids to sexualized content right. or material or contexts um, at such a young age and who are getting upset at those of us who are saying that's not appropriate. You really have to wonder about that. And so I think a lot of this, I'm, I'm concerned about the kids transitioning, but I think it's also part of a larger push or ideology or movement that is really about trying to use kids as a pawn and it's part of just really trying to destroy i think um 
everything that is that makes sense in the world very intentionally. Yeah, it's 100% a deconstructionist movement. It, it's they're completely interested in just deconstructing everything that we hold as very basic facts of life. And I also think the uglier part of this that people sometimes are not ready to hear is that there is absolutely a pro pedophile movement that has latched itself onto this, all of this. That doesn't mean everyday trans people, everyday gay people, everyday drag queens, because I agree, it's not the case, you know. But there is this other element that's come into play in recent years that is really scary. And I think that anyone who thinks that, you know, gender ideology is not being used as a tool by those who are seeking to normalize pedophilia more so than society is just not paying attention. I think the drag queen story hour thing is a really good example. I don't think there's any reason why anyone should be okay with kids at a drag performance, but yet it's there and it's being defended. It, Drag Queen Story Hour, I think it's so goofy that it's being defended with the same intensity that people were defending gay rights and trans rights. People are acting like if like drag queens are not allowed to perform in front of children, that it's some sort of human rights violation. And that to me is what lets me know that this movement is completely off the rails, that we're treating everything with the urgency of like Matthew Shepard. Yeah, and the sad thing, I mean, I've had people say to me, I had Chris Rufo on my podcast uh, a couple of weeks ago, and people are saying, like, why are gay and trans people pushing this agenda? And I'm thinking they are not like everyday gay and trans people are, do, are vehemently against this, if anything. And so I really think the activism is doing such a disservice to those communities. I mean, especially gay people have come both gay and trans people have a history of having to deal with these really negative stereotypes and yeah. I'm, I'm just wishing that people would wake up and say you know enough is enough and it's not about a left or right thing this is really about just like let's be sane and rational about this and let's also like put kids first and i think there's um you know from my experience having worked with sex offenders and work having worked with pedophiles i do think it's that that in some ways these offenders and these abusers capitalize on the fact that people are uncomfortable with this conversation and about understandably people don't want to talk about this because it is you don't want to think about that with children right children are so precious and they're so innocent and and so i think the fact that many people choose not to talk about it or not really want to pay attention to it is why it keeps happening so that's what i feel you know and i really appreciate what you do with your channel as well i feel it's really important to keep talking about it and to let people know that pretending it's not happening is not actually going to protect kids and and if you think that this is not going to affect your children just because you think that you're actually putting your children at risk because that makes them actually more vulnerable to predators. And it already is affecting them if they're in public schools in almost any state in America, minus a few like, you know, Florida and maybe some districts in Texas. It's like they're already getting taught just insane things about gender. But um, we got to wrap it up, Dr. Deborah. But this was an amazing interview. There is you said everything that like I wish I could say in the artful way that you say it. Uh, so it's been great. What's next for you? Any more books coming? Where, where can people follow you? Yeah, I mean, I would love to do a second book. Um, people can find me at drdebrasso.com. You can get The End of Gender on my website or on Simon & Schuster's website. And you can also find my podcast everywhere. Thank you so much, Blair, for having me on. It's been such a joy to get to talk to you. Of course. We'll talk again soon. Thank you so much.